Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. I'm Mark Leslie Lefebvre, your host, and in the forthcoming episodes, you'll hear interviews and conversations centered on creativity, writing, and publishing. I'll be talking to authors, editors, publishers, industry experts, as well as other creative folks whose work can help inform and inspire those for whom writing is a central activity. In this first episode, I'm going to share some of my own personal plans and goals. As I'm recording this, it's early January 2018. I recently left a fantastic position that I had in the industry in order to attempt a change in lifestyle. I've always loved helping others, but I wanted to be able to do that without wearing any specific corporate hat. Part of the change was an intent to spend more time writing and more time helping other writers and publishers with their own writing and publishing goals. So, along with the chats and interviews and perspective on writing and publishing, I'll also be sharing my own personal updates on my writing life and my role as a consultant in the book industry in the hopes that this open exploration into what I'm doing can help inform and even inspire you in your own personal journey. If at any point you have any questions you'd love me to answer or topics to cover, please email me at mark at marklesley.ca, or you can reach out to me via Twitter, at Mark Leslie. But let's get on with this episode's topic, shall we? The start of a new year is always a time for reflection. It's often a chance to look back at the previous year and the goals accomplished during that previous year, and it usually also involves setting some goals or targets for the year ahead. Now, I've continued to do that each year, but if you're like me, And perhaps you also fall prey to one of those other pesky little side effects that can come when reflecting on your goals. You end up focusing only on the things that you didn't get to strike off your annual writing to-do list. We tend to always do that to ourselves. For example, last year in 2017, one of my writing goals included creating and launching a new short story collection. Another involved writing the first draft of the sequel to my novel A Canadian Werewolf in New York. And the third involved getting the audiobook for A Canadian Werewolf in New York completed. I didn't get any of those three things done. And I could focus on that. Or I could take a look at the details behind each, and I could applaud myself for coming close in achieving several of those tasks, or even look at the work that I've been able to do on them and see how much I actually got done and where I am in relation to where I was at the beginning of the year. So looking at the things that were actually accomplished related to those goals. So I'm going to go through those in a little bit of detail just to illustrate uh, what I'm trying to get across here. So in regards to the short story collection, I didn't end up putting together the story collection that I had planned. I initially launched my self-publishing career, if if you would uh, have it, in 2004 with a short story collection, and I thought it would be appropriate to try to bring out uh, a newer one, a more revised one, with newer stories that have been published, or even written and not published since then, which is kind of how I did the first one. Now, I didn't do the full short story collection I was planning, but I did some experimentation, and I ended up adapting that into a different goal. I did create a smaller story collection, one that I launched into the Kindle Direct Publishing Select program so that I could test the Kindle Unlimited Waters. Now, while I have never been a fan of being exclusive to any particular retailer, I felt it was important for me, especially because of my previous role heading up the self-publishing team at a Kindle competitor, 
Kobo to better understand a writer's perspective with being in the program. Sure, I've had a title in KDP Select since it was launched, but I didn't ever do much with it. And the topic of the book I published, while perhaps interesting or hot in 2011, isn't new, isn't up to date. I wanted to give it a shot with something relatively new. So, in experimenting, I created four volumes of shorter booklets that contained three short stories each. They were approximately 12,000 or so words each. And then I did a box set, or a complete version of those four booklets that was about 50,000 words in length. And I launched them starting uh, mid-year, and I did uh, practically one every three or four weeks, looking at that Kindle cliff people keep talking about. Now, I didn't do any promotion for it. I didn't advertise it. I didn't share anything other than enter the titles into um, those uh, five free days or countdown deals that you can get when you're locked into exclusivity with Amazon Kindle. I wanted to see if, without any real promotional activity, if an author could earn revenue just by being in that exclusivity program. So, so far in the first six months of this experiment, I've earned $18.48 US from this. $11.47 came from sales royalties, actually selling units, and $7.01 has come from the Kindle page reads. The overall page reads count was 1,888 pages, and of course my December page reads of 232 pages hasn't yet been calculated of this recording, so perhaps I'll have earned another 85 or 90 cents from December. So that'll, uh, you know, crank me up to just under $20 on this experiment. Now the other thing that I uh, didn't mention is I didn't mention how many downloads I had or how many free downloads I had. Now typically I, I tend to worry more about um, actual sales, but I thought in this particular case, since it is part of a, a reading program, I thought I would share the fact that it was approximately 200 units were given away for free during that six month period as well. And the reason I raise that is because for these books, I shared my earnings, I shared the downloads, the page reads, I still haven't gotten a single review on any of these five items, and I thought that was important because one of the reasons why you provide a book for free is to try to get people to read it so they can review it. So uh, that either says um, people weren't enjoying the books, and I'm okay with that. I'm a writer. I can take it. I got thick skin. Or it just meant that the people who were reading those books aren't typically people who would review or write the books. So uh, I've got that going on uh, as well and thought I would share that tidbit. I actually stopped recording to go back and look at those numbers because when I was compiling the information I realized I completely skipped out on that part. Additionally, you'll notice that I haven't mentioned the name of these volumes because I'm not trying to promote or um, push them in any way, shape, or form. So I specifically didn't talk about what the titles were called. Not that hard to find if you're really interested in it, but this isn't a promotion talk. This is a talk about my experiences and how this worked. Now, looking at that goal, the original goal was creating a, uh, a short fiction collection. And I looked at what I did uh, specifically going into, you know, the Kindle Unlimited or KDP Select program with exclusivity, which I'm still experimenting with and curious to see what happens next. But alongside of that, there was something that happened that I hadn't been intending. I ended up earning other royalties from a few virtual anthologies that I hadn't even planned on being a part of. So I had put up a number of different short stories that ended up becoming part of digital bundles via bundlerabbit.com, which is a collaborative publishing website where authors can put bundles together um, and, and use other people's stories. So I participated in a number of collaborative author projects there, and these short stories earned me $48.70 US uh, in 2017. Now it's interesting because Bundle Rabbit continues to be a part of that ongoing passive income where all I really need to do is upload a story and accept an invite from a curator on Bundle Rabbit. 
I maybe post a few links to the bundle, but then I just enjoy the ongoing long tail incoming additional funds. So that's the first goal, talking about that short story collection. What I did achieve, what I didn't achieve, and the very modest earnings that I made from those goals. Now, let's go over to the second goal. This was writing the sequel to A Canadian Werewolf in New York. So I ended up visiting California uh, twice in the past 12 months. Uh, well, not, not to count where I'm stuck at, um, at the LA airport on a transition, but I'm talking about actually going into California and actually being in uh, Los Angeles. And, and I had some fun with some really cool friends there. There's both folks that I knew from previous travel. Hey, Julie, how's it going, dude? As well as new friends that I made there um, on, on both of those trips. And I wanted to return to Los Angeles uh, with Michael Andrews, the main character in my Canadian werewolf book. See, I thought it would be interesting to inject him into the Hollywood scene in a book that follows that same long, cheeky reference title to a popular movie. This uh, book was um, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles. And I wrote a little over 50,000 words of the first draft during NaNoWriMo or National Novel Writing Month, which is a exercise for writers in November in an attempt to write 50,000 words. So I hit the 50,000 word goal, but I didn't finish the first draft because I still need to write another 25,000 to 30,000 words in order to finish that first draft. And then what'll happen is I'll end up probably cutting 20,000 words and replacing them with another 10 or 15 thousand words um, in that rewrite process. So I didn't achieve the goal of finishing the draft, but I did actually get it started, and I got a good portion of it started, and I got a lot of that book mapped out. So while I didn't succeed in that task, I did at least get most of that first draft done. Now I'm going to look back in time uh, on a similar exercise, and I recall that I actually started my thriller A Canadian Werewolf in New York during NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, in 2006. And I didn't even hit 25,000 words in that first attempt in that 30-day period. Not only that, but this was documented live as I was working on it as part of Paula B's The Writing Show podcast reality series. And the reality series was called getting published with Mark Leslie. I will post a link to that in the show notes. But my embarrassing non-achievement is still out there for the world to see. And over the past few years, I've bumped into several people who recognized me from that very embarrassing episode. Yes, it was embarrassing. Or maybe it was part of showing other writers that they are not alone in some of those incomplete tasks, some of those incomplete projects that you have left on the back burner. Because when I look at that in retrospect, I did finally finish writing the book. I finally finished it in 2014, 2015, and then I got it edited and published in 2016. So when I look at that incomplete first draft of Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, I remember just how long it took me, 10 years, to get a Canadian werewolf in New York out. And I'm pretty sure, learning from that experience, that it's not going to be 10 years before I publish the sequel and people can read more about what Michael Andrews is up to on the other side of the U.S., on the West Coast instead. Now for the third thing. I had the plan of getting the audiobook done for a Canadian werewolf in New York. I wanted to get that completed in 2017. Now, when Amazon's ACX program opened up for Canadian authors, finally, I decided to invest in the non-exclusive audio creation option to get a Canadian Werewolf New York completed. This was the plan where I paid the narrator up front. Now I listened to several dozen auditions and I narrowed it down to a few people that I really really adored and then I selected one. Now the deadline for the narrator to get all the files back to me was September 30th 2017. I ended up providing some uh, revision notes to him after seeing the first 12 or 15 chapters and uh, he's currently at about chapter 24 of the 35 or so chapters in the book, but he's still not finished. Now, over the course of this time, in the fall of 2017, my own life became so hectic that I hadn't had time to send more than one follow-up message to him just to check in and see where he was. I'm not angry with him. 
I like his style. I love his voice. And I'm quite pleased to be working with him. So what I'm going to do after I finish recording this is I'm going to send a polite reminder just to poke him, find out what's going on, perhaps something happened in his life, and um, see if we can work together to get this project back on track. A, so I can pay him for this, and B, so I can actually have that audiobook released. But here's something that happened that I hadn't planned on during this particular goal. Find Away Voices launched a program similar to ACX. Except, Find Away Voices uh, didn't just put the books into Audible and iTunes. It distributes to multiple retailers. And, interestingly enough, Find Away Voices allows the author to set and control the pricing. This is a potentially disruptive element to the creation of audiobooks for indie authors. They're not locked in to exclusivity, and they have the ability to control the price for the first time. Quite an amazing opportunity. So I ended up meeting with the good folks at Find Away Voices, uh, uh, got to know them, got to know Kelly and a, and a, a few people from the team, uh, wonderful people to work with, and I ended up loading my previously produced Thriller Evasion, which I had created the year before through Listen Up Audio, uh, more great folks. I had the chance to actually uh, see their studios last year. Um, but anyways, I had that produced, and because with Listen Up Audio, I paid for it and I own all the files, I was able to load evasion to find away voices and then select the additional sales channels that listen up doesn't distribute to as well as using find away voices to have my chap book active reader and other cautionary tales from the book world as well as collateral damage a short story in my sin eater universe where my novel i death takes place uh, produced i was able to get that done through find away voices now here's the interesting thing the earnings so far from Findaway Audio, again, this was a not expected and not originally planned audio achievement in 2017, has already earned me over $217 US. And here's the other fascinating thing. While Audible is seen by most authors as the only audiobook game in town, and they have their similar exclusivity terms to lock authors into with a higher royalty rate, for being exclusive to Audible and, and iTunes. I didn't earn anything off Audible through Findaway Voices yet. But with Findaway, even though I did distribute to Audible and iTunes, I haven't made a dime off them. My money has been earned through three places that were never even on my radar when it came to audiobooks. Biblioteca, uh, which is a 3M company, TuneIn, and Playster are where I earned my royalties. Now, 70% of my earnings through Findaway came from Playster. And I recall earlier, and I don't have the details in front of me, but when I was cashing one of my royalty checks from Listen Up earlier this year, I remembered that the majority of that last check came from one of those platforms like Playster that weren't even on my radar. And it's not on the radar of most indie authors when it comes to audiobooks. So I also learned that benefit of publishing wide and being available everywhere because you never know where those customers are going to find your work and you never know where you're going to get those earnings. Now, the reason that I took the time to outline three of my goals, specifically goals that I didn't achieve in the past year, is to illustrate two main things that I think are important for writers to remember. One, you don't always fully achieve the goals you set out to, but sometimes you do make progress, which is good. And other times you end up achieving other things in parallel that you hadn't originally planned. Don't lose sight of those achievements in the process of beating yourself out about the things you didn't strike off that to-do list. You still may have made progress and every single act of progress gets you closer to that goal. So that is forward momentum. You can also take a look at the things you plan to do and see if they're still right for you. You planned them maybe six months ago, maybe you planned them a year ago. Is that a goal that is still pertinent to you and the place you want to go? You can add to, you can modify, and you can adjust your goals as your own needs, as your own work, as your own passions, and as elements in the publishing industry change. And that's okay. It's not set in stone. You're allowed to be flexible. You're allowed to modify. 
you're allowed to adapt and change. Provided, and I think it's important that you're making some sort of forward momentum, that at the end you have achieved at least a small thing, which is one step closer towards that goal. And that's important to celebrate. Now, finally, I shared my very modest earnings because one of the things that frustrates me to no end and it's the fact that it seems that only the authors who are earning six and seven figure incomes are celebrated and are publicly sharing their earnings and this leads to a significant amount of a uh, term that I'm borrowing from Joanna Penn called comparisonitis. Now from my previous experience running Kobo self-publishing platform Kobo Writing Life I know that the majority of authors are earning three and four figure incomes and many are earning two figure incomes so only focusing on the authors who are making a killing and earning six and seven figures can be a hugely demoralizing experience now in 2017 I earned from my writing a low five figure income and that includes both traditional publishing and self-publishing. Let me break that down for you. 27% of 2017's revenue came from self-publishing sources or indie publishing. 20% of that revenue came from traditional publishing sources. And 52% of that came from what I define as mixed sources. That's because it's kind of challenging to put it in either completely self-publishing or completely traditional publishing. So this would be, for example, revenues from things like working uh, with Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush on the WMG publishing anthologies, the Fiction River anthologies that I have edited. And here's why. Yes, it's a traditional publishing process. I work as an editor. They pay me as an editor. I work with writers. I purchase stories, etc. But it's done dynamically, like indie publishing. WMG publishing is very dynamic and can change quickly just like indie publishing and I also got into this role via the self for indie publishing space so I always think of that as more independently achieved earnings rather than through the uh, old traditional way. It's not like I went I pitched a book to a publisher through an agent and I got it done that way. It was done more hands-on more indie spirited which is why I think of that as more mixed um, other sources for that are uh, the Public Lending Rights Program, which is a program open for Canadian authors. I will provide a link to that in the show notes uh, because very soon, uh, in early in the year, uh, usually between February and May, you can uh, submit the titles that you had published the previous year, and you get paid for these books just appearing, uh, either the print books or the e-books appearing in the public library system in Canada and it's basically earnings against royalties and that's usually a pretty significant check for me each year and I have indie published titles and traditionally published titles that I earn income off of but again that's mixed uh, earnings and then there are other things like selling titles that I've bought myself either I've printed myself or I've purchased um, you know through through my publisher at a discount to sell directly to consumers at comic cons where I do make a, a small bit of margin on those um, and and that includes both of those titles so that's why 52 percent of my revenue from selling actually came from those mixed sources so again 27 percent from self-publishing 20 percent from traditional and 52 percent from mixed again uh, as an author myself I found that being open to both self-publishing and traditional publishing opportunities allow me to make more income uh, as a writer and that's something I'm going to continue to expand in the next year. Now another thing that I've already beat myself up about is the fact that it's already January 5th as I record this and I haven't yet done a fully complete breakdown of 2017 my achievements nor of my full 2018 goals and I could focus on that or I could recognize that schedule some time into my calendar which I did earlier this morning for each of those tasks so in the next two weeks I've scheduled an hour each for uh, reflecting on my full goal list for 2017 and making sure that I take time to acknowledge the things I did achieve of course I don't want to spend too much time patting myself on the back that can be just as non-productive as beating myself up over those mixed goals and 
The other time is setting some specific targets for things that I intend to complete in 2018, specific and measurable targets. So, in conclusion to these thoughts on a new year beginning and reflecting back on the previous year, I think it's important to be able to pause, take a look at things, and see where I might need to retarget my goals. For example, in 2018, outside of writing, I plan on running my first half marathon. It's going to happen at the end of April, sneaking up on me. How will I adapt both a training slash running schedule into a more aggressive writing and consulting time schedule? Well, by understanding my own strengths and my own weaknesses when it comes to these activities and very specifically blocking specific planning and training time for each of these activities into my calendar and then holding myself accountable for those times that I've blocked. Now I'm going to keep you updated on how both are going as the year chugs along. But let's take a look. If you haven't done it already, have you paused? Have you looked at what you're writing and publishing goals were in 2017 and have you scheduled some time to look at what those goals are going to be for the coming year. I think it's really really important to get those things into your calendar so you can actually commit yourself to analyzing, understanding, and then setting forth those next goals. And hopefully you'll have an opportunity to reflect on them in a realistic fashion without beating yourself up or without patting yourself on the back too hard. Related to publishing information, I wanted to just take a, a reflective look at the industry itself and what I've been thinking uh, about for this. Now, while writing might have always been seen uh, as a solitary activity, I mean, storytelling itself has always been about a collaboration between the storyteller and the listener, or to put it another way, between the writer and the reader, I think we're continuing to see more opportunities for writers to connect directly with readers, particularly through digital publishing. We're also seeing authors collaborating in ways that transcend simple co-authoring or multi-author promo bundles. And a couple examples, look at the Authors on a Train, there'll be a link to that in the show notes. This is an experience led by Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon. Or look at the tools that offer royalty splitting, and I mentioned this earlier in the podcast with companies like BundleRabbit.com. But even beyond those things, there are also more opportunities to expand storytelling into new venues and new formats. I pause and I look at amazing things that are happening with companies like One More Story Games and their Story Stylist 2. Again, there'll be links to that in the show notes. That this allows writers to create, publish, and play interactive story games. And I marvel at the still untapped opportunity for true story interaction. And I will be interviewing Gene from One More Story Games about that in a forthcoming episode. But what we are still only just seeing the pioneering beginnings of are elements that involve next-level collaborations that are going to continue to make the publishing landscape more dynamic than ever before and expand the provision of ample opportunities for writers. Now I look forward to seeing more opportunities and more collaborations take place. And in the next episode I'm going to be having a chat with Joanna Penn, not only about her most recent book for healthy writers, but also talking about her visions for the future of writing and publishing. Thank you so much for listening to episode one of Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing. I'm Mark Leslie the Fave, your host. You can find the show at starkreflections.ca or you can check me out at marklesley.ca. If you have any comments, I strongly encourage you to leave them. And please do, if you enjoyed this podcast, leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice or share it with a writer or publishing person that you think would benefit from this. Thanks for listening to episode one and look forward to catching you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.